we are going to start off with Tony Butterfield uh, talking about the science visualization on the dome. So whenever you're ready. All right, good evening. This is a two hour workshop in 10 minutes, so I'll do like my boss and talk twice as fast. The, uh, <laughs> for anybody that hadn't heard, I'm not gonna talk about the hurricane, but it was a bad deal. Um, so <clears throat> let's just pray that the internet holds out because this is my desk in Houston. Uh, I'm uh, here to talk about science visualization and uh, we remodeled our planetarium uh, and opened up with a true 8K system and then started production and I create uh, the uh, content for the 8K theater. And so uh, the whole production pipeline had to be just uh, reinvented and uh, basically had to learn like 10 pieces of software in six months and become an expert at it. But um, we have finished our first 8K show, Tales of a Time Traveler, narrated by David Tennant. And uh, there's trailers floating around and fun stuff uh, here at the conference. And you'll probably see a lot more of it um, through ENS's demo. So uh, as far as part of uh, creating the scenes, uh, the part that is challenging is assets. And so in order to create the scenes and the animations, it, having quality assets. And uh, those are the, the, the props, as you could say, in, in the scene. Uh, and one of the uh, things I'm gonna talk about tonight is how I created some of the assets f that is used in Tales of the Time Traveler. So a uh, piece of technology uh, which uh, made a lot of it possible is something called photogrammetry. Photogrammetry is basically the concept of taking a picture and backwards engineering a 3D shape. It's uh, now gotten to the point where computers have the horsepower that if you throw three or 400 photos at it, uh, it'll backwards crunch the, uh, the, the shapes and the lighting and the position to the point where you can end up with a 3D object. So uh, that's uh, what I'm going to present here uh, in the next six minutes. So there's, this is a huge field and it's, uh, there's more ways of messing it up than getting it right. So uh, what I'm gonna do is show you a little bit what I've been doing uh, this week while you guys were doing papers and introduce uh, what photogrammetry is and kind of uh, show you a piece of one of my scenes and then uh, hopefully uh, wrap it up. So first off, like I said, photogrammetry is using photos. Uh, now photos can be from your phone uh, or it can be from you know high quality digital camera. And uh, in fact, the th three samples that I'm gonna show you are actually from uh, this phone. And so it's, it just goes to show that it can be done. It's just uh, like anything, the better the source material, the, the better the outcome. So uh, the first off, uh, uh, before you guys got here, I had to go and start collecting all the stuff in the, in the vendor hall because we provided all of the domes. This is one of the buckets uh, that I shipped uh, one of the um, um, domes in. So, um, so what I did is um, took uh, 84 pictures. Now, when I first started out, I figured, hey, you know, 10, 20, it was hard for me to take more than 40 pictures because I figured top, down, left, right, front, back, hey, you got it covered. No, I mean, it's like uh, I learned the hard way uh, that more the better. I mean, like, you can't take not enough pictures. Uh, you can't take, you can never take too many pictures uh, to, to, to do this. So this is, this is just 84 pictures. Now, uh, the software, there's a couple pieces of software out there that specializes into it. Uh, Autodesk has gotten real good at uh, offering their product line and then quitting it uh, and then rebranding it and, uh, and charging more for it. In fact, getting ready for this, I went to go to open up a file of which they said, we've discontinued this product and now you can sign up for their new one. Uh, but this one is actually another industry standard piece of software called Agisoft and you can see the pictures from my phone and what's really kind of cool is I take the pictures, I upload load it to my Google Drive and then my desktop in Houston is connected to the Google Drive and then I just bring the project in. So, so photography is the key and uh, uh, lighting is the secret. 
You can't move anything. The lighting can't uh, uh, change, um, which goes to be a problem if you're outside, because if a cloud goes over, then the whole thing's you know, thrown out. The two things you can't have are things that are really super shiny and things that are really, really black, and because there's no information there. So basically what you do is you, uh, you bring in your photos, you add your photos, and then uh, it aligns the photos. The, the advantage about using a mobile device versus a digital camera is it's got all the data as the tilt, the angle, and, and stuff embedded into, uh, into the photo. So that gives it the advantage. And so that's why I don't give up on my phone because you can actually do a lot with it. So uh, I was in the, the room there with the cargo and took a picture of this box uh, 84 times. And then I built uh, a point cloud. Basically, a point cloud is like you may have heard of LiDAR where they go out and scan something, uh, but they backwards engineer a point cloud based on all of the photography. So then once you have a point cloud, then um, the next step is to uh, build a mesh. And basically, it takes points that are close together and make triangles, and the triangles then build up a mesh. And um, it looks uh, kind of like that. So. Um, the cool thing about this is that it, um, you've got all those pictures. So now you've got a great resource for a texture map. And just like when you stitch together a panorama, it stitches together all the photos and uses it as a texture map. So uh, this is an example of the box. It's just a low resolution preview. Uh, but it looks good right here, but it's missing most of the bottom. <laughs> this is an example of a fail. And so then you have to go back and you know, figure out what's the problem with the lighting. But you can see right away that um, you know, it's got the general shape. And, and if I were to have done a higher resolution texture, you could do everything. So this is an example of, of um, it was just bad lighting uh, down below. Um, let's do another example. Uh, last week, I stayed at a bed and breakfast, and I rented a tiny house. It was literally the tiny house. Uh, so I, for fun, uh, walked around and um, took pictures of it. Now, and you can see some of the pictures here. It's a tiny house. Um, so, you know, I couldn't obviously get behind it, and I couldn't get above it. Uh, and so I did what I could and just kind of, you know, played with it. So you can see that it, it gets you partly there, uh, but to go the extra you know, step uh, takes time and effort and, and proper setup. Uh, so this house looks kind of OK, except for when you look top down, you realize that the wall is not quite 90 degrees to the other wall, and so that's another fail. So it's all about surface area. Uh, the whole point of photogrammetry is you're backwards engineering and creating a mesh. And with this mesh, uh, it, I just kind of uh, uh, relate to it as the difference between a spoon and a fork. You know, a spoon's going to be easy, but a fork, you know, you got to get in between there. And, uh, and so it's that, that's the difference. Um, so along with all the different tools of having to, to do this, um, it just so happens Microsoft is building this ecosystem to incorporate 3D into their future back end. And so they've been kind of trickling down some more assets to help you on uh, the user to be able to do more 3D stuff. Oh, well, let me go back to the, uh, the scan. So um, all right, so here's, here's a backyard. Um, so I walked around. And was you know just trying to play with these uh, plants and pots. Um, sometimes uh, uh, you know the stuff in the background. You know, anyway, um, so I took a picture of these. You know what did I take? I took 147. So this is obviously just goofing around. But um, so here it stitched it and output it. And then during dinner time, uh, I output it. And then once I output it. Uh, I brought it into uh, Microsoft's new 3D object viewer. Um, and from there, um, you know, you can, you can do, you can verify that it converted right. 
Uh, but then there's some tools about filling in the holes and, and making sure everything's on the up and up. Uh, and so this is one of the tools that Microsoft is including in to get everybody ready for their mixed reality portal. Uh, the other thing is being able to um, paint on the objects. That's, that's another um, valuable tool because then let's say you want to goof with something. Uh, well, you know, now you can actually uh, paint on the object and save it out. And let's say you need to touch it up or something like that. So these are all 3D uh, meshes that saved out with their proper texture maps. And so my paper's on science visualization, and so trying to get assets uh, from our museum uh, into the show, uh, I walked around and took lots of pictures of lots of things. And so here is the real one of many mummy sarcophaguses that we have at our museum. Um, and here's a chair. Uh, apparently this is a, a sex god, and Terrence made me put a clock in front of his, his uh, bits there. I didn't even notice. Um, uh, okay, here's some gems and minerals that are by the elevator. Um, uh, here's one of those, I've, what's the technical term for these space clocks? I don't know, but it's, uh, these are like rare and expensive. Um, there's one of our Alice horses, some furniture. These, uh, Terrence wanted, Terrence Murtoff wanted a Victorian style couch. So there's a Victorian museum with a couch in the middle of it. And I bought a ticket and uh, photograph, uh, you know, uh, it like crazy. And so this is a real, you know, couch that's on display. Oh, and then this is, there's gems and minerals all, well, there's a gems and mineral hall. Uh, and there's this gem, and you can actually, that's the, like the asset number for the collections department. So, um, you know, and I've got CG stuff, but in order to make things look realistic, it's, it's time? Ian. Um, so that's it. Uh, the idea of being able to uh, make stuff, bring it into an environment. Now you can do dinosaur bones and giant crinoids. Uh, and uh, this is what it's all about, right? Thank you, Tony. All right, so unfortunately, that was the 12 minutes, so we don't have time for your questions. Um, but if you have questions after, please go see Tony. Our next speaker is going to be Ryan Wyatt from the California Academy of Sciences. Whereas Tony was cramming two hours into 10 minutes, I'm less ambitiously trying to deliver a talk I normally deliver in about a half hour uh, in 10 minutes. So this is the rapid fire greatest hits. <laughs> what is is. So. Uh, so, the title of my talk is What is Viz? I hope uh, most of you probably get the idea that that's what is visualization. Uh, the word gets bandied about a lot increasingly with data visualization, science visualization. I'll just note that um, what I'm going to focus on is really not about storytelling with visualization, which I think is a critical topic, but again, in the interest of 10 minutes, we're going to really focus on the visual representation of data. Uh, which is something that, as we move into this era of data to dome, is something that more and more members of the community are going to be doing. And so I would like to encourage us to be as thoughtful as possible in the way we uh, think about this. I'm also going to note that I'm, uh, if, you don't, if you're a note taker, just don't even bother. I'm going to go fast, and I'm putting all of the resources on my web page, which I'll give you the link to at the end of the talk. So uh, just listen, and please don't try to take notes, because It'll even make me more nervous. Anyway, this is a talk I've been giving about 12 years because I was originally inspired to do this with my previous job. Uh, I was offered a position at the, at the um, 
American Museum of Natural History, and I actually didn't even know what the position title was going to be until a few weeks before um, I, uh, I accepted the offer. And so the title Science Visualizer kind of made me wonder exactly what they expected me to do. I kind of thought maybe I'd be sitting in my office with incense burning and sort of <laughs> visualizing what science was. And um, in the interest of making that joke, I actually just did a Google search, as you do, and I found an image like this. And in the interest of... Uh, Avoiding copyright infringement, I just made my own version. Uh, but, um, but yeah, I found this image that's kind of like this new agey Ganesh in front of the Pleiades. Highly appropriate, of course, for this conference. And, and, uh, and I initially put this in as sort of a joke, and then I realized actually there's something kind of deeply meaningful about this, which I'll get to in a moment. Fundamentally, data visualization is about taking the ones and zeros of data, and all science is digital now. So all of our science really is uh, in this format, and transforming it into something that might be as straightforward, air quotes around that, as taking those image data and creating something that is as beautiful as uh, Pillars of Creation. Now, this is actually not the original Pillars of Creation. Uh, this is the uh, re-release higher resolution version that was taken a few years ago. So the color mapping is not identical to what Jeff Hester originally did, but the basic idea is there. He was visualizing this for the purpose of understanding the physics of the nebula that he's looking at. So he color coded basically um, in his original image, which is not quite the case here, uh, the original image was uh, blue for oxygen, ionized oxygen, uh, yellow, or, or, sorry, green was sulfur, and then red was uh, uh, hydrogen, nitrogen. Now in this case, uh, they've altered that a little bit. They actually shifted uh, the sulfur toward orange, but fundamentally, what he was interested in is looking at that intersection as the uh, ionizing radiation from the star, which is far above us in the image that's represented here, is eating away into these molecular clouds, he was interested in that interface that is revealed by the sulfur uh, ionization and stands out in beautiful contrast to the blue of the ionized oxygen. Now, as it turns out, he happened to do something else that artists have been doing for centuries. Blue is a color that recedes. Cool colors recede in an image. Warm colors come to the forefront. And so, inadvertently, Jeff created this beautiful image that plays on our visual aesthetic that has been built up for centuries and gives us this highly dimensional image in a color palette that ends up being used by Hubble for many of their images. Now, that's a relatively direct take, uh, way of taking the ones and zeros of image data, translating that into uh, uh, an image that's essentially photographic, even if the colors are not what we would see with our eyes. The opposite end of the spectrum, so to speak, we have data representations like this one. Now this is actually a graphing of the um, 40 some thousand some odd uh, stars in the uh, Hipparchus catalog into our, what's probably very familiar to everyone in this audience, the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Can anyone tell me what the color means? Temperature? Nope. Oh, don't raise your hand, just talk. <laughs> it's number density. So there are too many stars to be represented by the number of pixels in this image, so the red points our uh, greater number density, and they've sort of kindly kind of provided a, uh, a, a, um, a representation of that uh, stretch on the, in the lower left-hand corner. But for many reasons, this is a very difficult representation. It's layered with meanings that are familiar to people who are accustomed to reading sort of science visualizations, who are trained to know that the spectrum runs from red to orange to yellow to green to blue to indigo to violet, but that's not something that is going to be familiar to every member of our audiences. Now, I'm just going to toss out a couple other things here, kind of these hybrid, like, kind of a visualization, kind of an infographic, trying to get a little more friendly to offer people things like the relative sizes of some of the stars, although that doesn't even really get that right. And, uh, and these kind of in-between sort of visualizations uh, and infographics. And then things like uh, cartoons, which are kind of solidly in the infographic realm. But I think one thing that uh, I like about this image, and this is, comes from a 2001 paper by Tom Green, showing this time sequence of the evolution of a, of a protoplanetary disk actually plays into what is very familiar to many viewers, again, culturally, not so much intrinsically, uh, of, the, of sequential art, or as most people call it, comics. And so, these, uh, so there are these visual metaphors that are going to be familiar to our audience members, but other ones that are not going to be familiar at all. 
So fundamentally, I like to think about visualization as communication. Now, it can be communication to yourself. You're using the visualization to extract information from the data that you've collected, kind of like Jeff was doing with that image of M16. It can be communication to experts or peers, kind of like that Hertzsprung-Russell diagram with the color coding that wasn't familiar to many people in the room. Or it can be communication to general audiences, broad audiences. And I find that most of the errors and most of the problems that we encounter really happen because we tend to use vehicles that are intended for communications to peers, to expert users, and deploy them in the interest of a broader audience. And that's where a lot of kind of the fail, I think, takes place. Uh, and fundamentally, I like to point out is that with, with all means of communication, uh, these are subjective uh, representations of the data. So to go back to this, we have data, we have the ones and zeros of data that can be turned into beautiful images, like uh, the image of M16, or can be represented in ways that are not very familiar. And this is where we get back to Ganesh. Because in that image of Ganesh floating in front of the Pleiades, I might look at this and say, new agey Hinduism? But I, I know enough to know that uh, like the rat, the position of the hands, the symbology that's present in this represents something, I just don't know what those meanings are. And similarly, when I think we, when we present our publics with something like this, they may just say, science-y something. I don't know what that is, it's science, but not be able to extract meaning from it. So here's where compressing to 10 minutes gets a little random. So I'm just gonna point out that, uh, so I'm gonna go back to visual metaphors for a moment and then I'm gonna do what I promised in my abstract, and that is just recommend a few references for more standard data visualization. And I know I'm gonna get the two minutes to go right now, yeah. So here, I think, is a great example by one of the great science visualizers in our community, Randall Monroe, who wanted to represent the relative surface area of various places in the solar system, and he combines them into a single island. He uses a metaphor of a map, and his cues are incredibly simple. He, rather than the usual black and white, he simply tints the background, and he gives us a little kind of uh, wave lines around the, uh, the exterior of the, this fictional island. But the metaphor is in service of the idea that he's trying to communicate, which is about surface area. Similarly, but as a complete fail, this is a group in New Zealand that put together this map of the brain. They used a map metaphor. They executed it much more beautifully and elegantly than Randall Monroe did but it's not in service of anything to do with the data. It's just a metaphor that they liked and chose to represent, but it doesn't give you anything additional uh, about the data. So I point that out as something to think about when we do, because we do love to use metaphors in our shows. When we, when we use these metaphors, make sure that they are actually in service of the message uh, that we're trying to deliver. Now we're gonna get really fast. So one of the books that I really like is Noah Alinsky's Designing Data Visualizations. It is a very thin volume. Don't buy the paper-bound version. It's printed on demand, it's black and white. Buy the PDF or the uh, Kindle version because they talk about color and you actually need to see the color. And that's in the PDF but not in the printed version. Uh, very quickly, he talks about four pillars of uh, visualization. Thinking about the purpose, the why, the content, the what, structure, the how, formatting, which is everything else. So something like the formatting of that map is the everything else that ends up getting in the way of some of the other messages. Um, he uses that as a basis for kind of a recipe to when you want to visualize particularly graph data, and it's, a, it's an extraordinarily helpful structure. He also has, uh, and this is actually on his website, Complex Diagrams, uh, a great little guide to the properties uh, and uses of, of uh, visual encodings. So when you think about graphing things, there are certain things that your visual system does automatically. Big things are important, small things are not. So you, your visual system cues into size, and that's a very ordered, structured, um, a way that it's interpreted. Whereas something like color, as I previously mentioned, kind of appears in the middle of this guide, uh, is not intrinsically ordered. Instead, it's the order that we've superimposed on it uh, by our understanding of the wavelengths of light uh, to assign the spectrum to our rainbow color scheme uh, that results in the images like this. So uh, as a, just a, a brief shout out to the other few percent of the population who, like me, are colorblind, if you do uh, want to see whether your, your uh, encoding is going to work for colorblind, you can actually, there are many tools. I'm, again, I'm going to link to those on my website. You can use to, to, uh, uh, to get better representations, but you can also just make it into a grayscale image. And if you see, as you do here, 
that that visual encoding no longer works because the brightest areas, again, something that your visual system cues into before anything else, are not the most intense areas. Instead, uh, the red areas turn into a darker uh, uh, a portion of the image. And in our planetarium domes, it's even worse because often our projectors don't do well with red. We see that in the WMAP image, a little bit better in the Planck image, but you get distracted by these brighter colors that are in the middle of the spectrum. And there's even a great group in uh, the uh, UK that is devoted to ending the rainbow. Uh, it's a group of climate scientists who are, have actually compiled a most amazing collection of resources about um, why you shouldn't use uh, this representation. I inserted this as a Hubble image that actually uses it correctly. Don't have time to tell you about that, but I will point out that very weirdly, this is available in black and white on their website, which makes no sense. A couple of the resources, Visual Thinking for Design by Colin Ware. He has big, thick, heavy books that are awesome. This is a nice, small, digestible book, which is even better. So I highly recommend this one. Data Points by Nathan Lau is also good. These are all going on my website, Visualizing Science, under the Resources tab, and it's just visualizingscience.ryanwhite.net. In a sort of delusionary kind of way, I actually included other examples, which I'm obviously not going to be able to talk about, but note that when we've encoded some of these uh, information from scenes for our shows, we've avoided use of uh, wide ranges of color, focusing instead on brightness to represent changes in data, uh, and that's uh, an attempt to kind of uh, hone in on, again, these intrinsic visual systems. So, visualizing science at runway.net. There's a tab that says resources. I'll put all the resources that I mentioned in this very brief talk. And I'm guessing I don't have time for questions. Correct. We are out of time for questions. So, just as a reminder for speakers, I'll hold up two fingers when you have two minutes left, and I'll hold up five when you are out of time. You are able to run into your question time, um, but then, like we've seen, we won't have time for questions. All right. So, thank you, Ryan. All right, up next we have Mark Subaral from IPS and Adler Planetarium. And uh, he will be talking about the IPS's Data to Dome initiative. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to talk about data to dome. Uh, there's already been a lot of talk about this concept. So this is an initiative by the International Planetarium Society to help prepare us for the oncoming big data, big data era. So to remind myself, I went and I just grabbed uh, a shot from today of the webcam on Sierra Patron watching the uh, construction of the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, and it's coming, right? That building's coming together, and in 2020, the hog first light, this telescope will collect, it's got a three billion pixel camera. It's gonna collect 15 terabytes of data every day, and it's gonna, for the first time, open up the dynamic universe. So instead of taking pictures of the sky, we're gonna have a movie. It's gonna identify 10 million things, new things, that are changing or moving every day, and it's gonna send out alerts within 60 seconds. 39 seconds is the current estimate of when they uh, take the image. Um, it will be processed and it'll be made available to the public. Ryan showed, showed our new beautiful website at the International Planetarium Society, and we have a Data to Dome page there, which has all these resources. Please check out our, our uh, web page. So a little bit about me first, uh, this is where I work. This is the Space Visualization Laboratory at the Adler Planetarium. It's a place where, it's a working laboratory where we take scientific data and we make uh, visualizations for the public and for our local researchers and we practice um, really sharing that with the public. It's constantly evolving. This is what I want to get to, right? So this, is what, this is the vision. So someday, this is the tool we'll have. But in the absence of that, the planetarium is still pretty cool, right? So uh, these are some data visualizations from our recent production of Planet Nine. 
All right. So the mission, there's a, there's a task force with the IPS. It's called the Science and Data Visual, Visualization Task Force. And the idea is that we want to make it easier to go from scientific data and discoveries to visualizations in our dome. And the, the easier we can make that process, the faster it'll be from the time things happen till we can show it. And the more the community will be able to do this. So right now, there's a long process that involves a lot of middlemen. I've been one of those middlemen. But I want to put people like me out of business, right? We want to make this automatic. And there's a reason for that. And the idea is by doing that, we can enrich the amount of topics, the information we can use for scientific communication, and for storytelling in the planetarium. That's the ultimate goal. All right, so uh, there are a bunch of um, specific goals of this task force, one of which is um, really trying to develop more data-savvy planetariums. And so one of the biggest questions I ask, like, you know, I have a small planetarium, or I want to hire someone, how can I do this kind of stuff? And I think what we're really talking about is the kind of skills that are needed for future planetariums are really data science skills. So the same kind of thing that's happening in every field, really, right now, is happening in ours. And we're, um, we're undergoing some efforts to help provide those skills to our community. Uh, the first major effort was this Data to Dome workshop, which we held in Tokyo in March. Um, you know, we set out, like on the website, wrote down a really big goal, right? So um, we said, the workshop will bring together planetarium professionals, astronomers, and visualization experts to advance the state of the art, right? I mean, that's really crazy, of big, big data visualization of the planetarium. But I think the seeds were planted. I feel really good about how this went. I think that's happening. So here's some shots of us. Look, at, look there's Doug from the front row and his cool glasses. Um, there's Ian with his VR helmet. Um, and uh, the, the way it was set up is that we had, we had some talks. Um, you know, we had some showcase sessions, but we also had working sessions where we got together around different technologies and we actually sat together and we made things. Um, all of those resources are available to you. Um, you can find them linked from that Data to Dome website uh, from the IPS. Um, we have all the videos from all the presentations online and we also have for the workshops, tutorials, sessions themselves, we have all of the code um, to uh, create that yourself, all the code and data that went into those workshops. So that's all available, and please, please use it. Um, another question that I've been getting a lot as we've been starting to do this is like, oh well, you know that data to dome stuff is great, but, but like, you know, how am I supposed to use it, and how do I talk about it uh, with with my visitors? And that's actually a really good question. So, uh, Carrie Berglund approached me about doing a session at Lips and. Um, and we did at the last uh, LIPS at, at Ball State. And it was a really interesting learning experience starting to work with this community and we're starting to broaden that. There was a mini, uh, uh, a, a little data to dome section at the next mini LIPS. Um, and we're gonna expand that and go deeper um, next year in Seattle. And I think really, and the idea is we don't have answers. We're trying to work together as a community to talk about like how do we take recent current science and show it in a way that people can understand and make it live, and make it interactive. Uh, one of the other goals uh, of the task force is, is to uh, work with the vendors, um, work with uh, planetarium uh, da or science data providers, people like ESO and, um, and Space Telescope, and get standards for them to deliver content to our community. And the first of those has been released. It's this data to dome standard. And it's a way for data providers to advertise through a feed what they're providing so that it can be found instantly in planetarium software and downloaded. So this is kind of the model by how that works. And it's, it's being implemented in a number of different software packages. Um, in, and you saw some nice demos, I think, uh, during the uh, ENS vendor session the other day. So we did a demo um, at 
uh, Immersa. It happened to be the same day that the TRAPPIST-1 announcement was made. And in the planetarium, we were able to, uh, to uh, click on a full dome resource, download a video, and play it back that same day the, after the morning of the press release. That's the kind of immediacy we're, we're aiming for. And finally, um, this, this other goal uh, has to do with the fact that we've been making better and better planetariums. The digital systems are getting more and more powerful, all with the goal of simulating a better and better night sky. But at the same time this has been happening, we've created a system that can do much more than we've traditionally been doing it. In fact, we've created a system that's not just useful uh, as a planetarium, as, as a public uh, demonstration, it's actually a cutting edge, world class scientific visualization facility that can be used by researchers to advance, actually advance science. And um, but one of the challenges is that scientists are completely unaware of the revolution that's happened in our community. So um, we've done a couple of things. Um, one of which is um, through this article by Tom Kwasnitska in Nature a few months ago. Um, it was actually an invitation to the scientific community to get engaged with their local planetarium. And so if you haven't read this, um, we actually have printouts at the IPS booth. So come, come down at, I forget which room, and uh, pick up a copy. Um, but it's also available online. Um, one of the things we've talked about in that context is actually building dual-use facilities. This could be a new funding model for planetariums. So instead of only being used for the public, it could be used for scientific research as well. And in fact, these type of facilities are already being built. The first one that opened up was the, at the uh, Iziko Museum in Cape Town, South Africa. And this was funded through a partnership with the planetarium, with the museum, and with local um, local universities, uh, most notably the University of Cape Town, who really spearheaded this initiative. Uh, so they're now uh, underway. There's a, um, myself with uh, Tom Jarrett at the opening. We had a little competition for who had the gaudiest tie. <laughs> Apparently it was a tie. But, um, <laughs> yeah. um, and there's Tom uh, in the dome with some of his data. Uh, finally, uh, there's an invitation to you if you want to get involved in these issues. We've created this website. It's actually being um, hosted by the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope Group. And um, it's just datatodome.org, or you can spell it with a T-O. It still works. Or you can use a com, and it still works. Um, please sign up and, and become a part of this community. Post your questions and, and find out what's happening. Um, I have finished in time, haven't I? That was exactly 10 minutes, so congratulations Score. to the second. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So we have two minutes for questions. Uh, there's anybody? Okay. Hello. Uh, I was just thinking as you were talking about getting uh, researchers into the dome uh, and then uh, seeing some of the software being presentation, uh, presented uh, about like uh, doing dome casts, mm -hmm. do you see a synergy between like LSST being able to live feed to the dome so this way maybe the audience can see within maybe minutes of what, what the telescope is actually looking at? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So I'm, and there are lots of different kinds of data, but things like, for instance, they'll put out that real-time alert stream, being able to tap into that alert stream. Um, you mentioned this idea of collaboration and, and dome casting as well. So that's, that's I think, a huge feature for our field. And we've, we've been, you'll hear from Patrick McPike later about what we've been doing at Adler. But I think there's also potential for the researchers as well because you can do, one of the advantages as opposed to, say, a VR headset is you can get a whole collaboration in a planetarium. But it's, un, it's unusual now to have collaborations in, in one place. So um, that dome casting can be powerful there. Actually, in your talk, one of the things that just occurred to me, even though I've, I've, we've talked about this before, is is there an, a formal out, or kind of connection to NOAA and the science on sphere community? Because it seems like uh, there must be a lot of similar, uh, they have, you know, they're putting out weather maps and things like that, talking about current science, and even though it's a different format, it's really an inverse of what we're, we're doing, and there must be 
synergies and stories we can share and data we can share. And I, it's something to think about to try to connect that. Yeah, and I think, you know, when you get down to, to the nitty gritty, I mean, there are lots of different types of data and lots of different formats. And we've, this, uh, this one format that we've, we've talked about, we we've have a few other things that we um, support, but it, it doesn't always carry the full wealth of formats. So we're, we're expanding that. Um, yeah, and I think we have time for one more. Is there anyone else? Simple and plain, when is the next Data at Home workshop? Ah, good question. So we, we don't have one planned, but I'm, not, I'm uh, in the process of seeking some funding for a Data to Dome workshop. And uh, my hope is to have it uh, um, next fall in Chicago. All right, thank you. Mark, everybody give some hand. All right, so up next we have Christine Shukla from the Lunar and Planetary Institute, and she'll be talking about sharing ongoing planetary exploration. Good evening, everyone. Ooh. Hi. Um, I wanted to share a little bit more about uh, sharing ongoing planetary exploration. And by planetary exploration, I don't just mean the missions. I mean the science, too. So I'm going to start with a question. Well, LPI is where I'm at right now, for those of you who are wondering. I kind of disappeared from the scene about 12 years ago. I'm uh, in Houston. and. Uh, Delighted to be with you today. Um, I work at the same facility as Paul Schenk, who uh, presented this morning about Pluto. So, why? Why is planetary science and exploration important to you? Well, first of all, is it? Is it? Yeah? OK. Why? Because it's cool. What do you all think of that answer? Yeah. Yeah? Anyone have another answer? It's about us. It's about us. Helps us see something beyond ourselves. It's a natural hook for our audiences. It's a natural hook for our audiences. Yes and yes and yes and yes. Anyone disagree with any of those? So it's a natural hook for our audiences. Do our audiences have any other reasons that we haven't already expressed? Planetary is something that you can go outside and look at. You don't even need a telescope sometimes. It's something that they might have cultural connections to. You can connect it to the days of the week. You can connect them to so many different things. They studied the planets. They had them memorized, maybe not in order, but they had them memorized by like fifth grade. So they know what Mars is. They may have never heard of a Seaford galaxy. So. Yes, it's a natural thing. It's something they've heard about. It's something that's in the news. So there's all these different reasons that your audiences might be interested. There's reasons you might be interested in it because your audiences are interested in it. So what do we do about it? Planetary discoveries. Do you guys find it hard to keep up with them? I do, and I work at the Lunar and Planetary Institute. I don't even try keeping up with galactic astronomy. So you might find it difficult. I. I Going to kind of give you a synopsis. OK, um, Messenger. How many of you feel pretty, pretty familiar with Messenger mission? How many of you thought, um, that's Mercury. It's just covered with craters. I'm not going to focus my time on that. There's other things that are more important. And that's the way a lot of people are, right? But it discovered some really awesome things. 
Uh, before Messenger, I really didn't care about Mercury. But I heard some really, really awesome talks about Messenger. Mercury has a triple layer core. That is awesome. It has a molten layer that's generating a magnetic field only because it has sulfur inside of it. That is awesome. It has, it has these, these icy places that are exposed and venting. Totally unexpected. Awesome. So we're constantly discovering interesting things. LRO, yeah, they found ice at the poles. Really, really neat. Um, of the moon. Uh, more data, anyway, to support that. Um, Dawn, New Horizons, the volcanoes on Pluto, pretty awesome. Um, Juno, Cassini, finding all sorts of things in the outer solar system. Uh, Enceladus being one that people are particularly interested in because of water and the possibility of life. Europa, future site for future missions, hot topic right now. Um, so these are all sorts of different things. Mars, you can't leave out Mars. Mars has missions and missions and missions and missions and missions covering things from planetary evolution and how it lost its atmosphere, the MAVEN mission. And uh, recently, some evidence for hydrothermal activity in the past on the surface. And um, evidence for supporting the oceans that may have existed on Mars. So all these different things. And that's just, you know, a tiny, 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 tiny bit. It's really, really hard to keep up with it. And then it's not just the missions, it's the models of what this means about our solar system. How many of you feel you've heard a lot about the light heavy bombardment? Quite a few of you have. It's, it's been in the news for a while. Um, this idea that we don't really know if, if, if in the early solar system, if the numbers just declined and declined and declined, or if they went down and then came back up and went down again. And that's an area of hot top, a hot topic for research. Um, and what caused it? Well, it might have been caused by the Nice model. If you go Googling the Nice model, watch what comes up um, if you're around small children. But um, <laughs> this idea of planetary migration, which, you know, 15 years ago, that's not what we studied, right? Planets were in orbit, and they weren't changing, and that wasn't going to change. So things like this, these ideas that are revolutionizing our idea of what a planet is, how it changes over time, how it evolves, how our solar system formed, how the moon formed, all of these things are hard to keep up with. But you need to know them, right? Because you're sharing them with your audiences because they're a hot topic. That's what they're interested in. So how do you keep up with it? Well, you can stay on top of all the different newsletters and websites, right? There's dozens of them. What's a favorite website or newsletter or source that you guys have? Where do you go to for your news? Say that again? Horton to the universe? Portal to the universe, thank you. Yes, portal to the universe, awesome. Awesome. Earth sky. Say it one more time. Earth to sky. Earth to sky, Earth to sky, great source. Wonderful source. Other sources? JPL News. JPL has a great news source. There's a lot of news sources out there. Um, there's also conferences. Um, most of you are probably familiar with the American Astronomical Society. They have a planetary science division that's meeting starting this Sunday in uh, Utah. <sighs> Some of us are going to be going there. Um, the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference happens every year in Houston. We have planetary scientists from around the world coming to that one every year. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that all planetarians come to any of these, because frankly, I, the ones that I attend and I attend these, I understand about two minutes out of every 15-minute talk, and I'm really, really happy if I do. So it's not packaged in a way that's easy to take and use. But that's one place where scientists are exchanging their ideas. There's all these organizations, JPL. Um, Goddard, NASA Goddard has a lot of planetary science. Um, APL at Johns Hopkins, a lot of planetary science emissions going on. Planetary Science Institute down in Houston, in Tucson. LASP in Colorado, Soiree in Colorado, LPI is where I am. These guys. They're doing the research, they're the sources of the data. I want to make sure that you have access to them. That's why I'm here. So, how can, um, you can use all the different sources you've talked about. There's the Solar System Exploration page that JPL has. There's NASA's Museum Alliance. How many of you are members of the, a lot of you are, so yeah. 
Um, they're a great source, although there's just so much of it that you might be overwhelmed and you might decide that you really can't attend every single telecom that they have, and I absolutely understand I wouldn't either. Um, but they're a great resource. So, but connecting with a planetary scientist might be an awesome way to do it, to get you access. So if you are looking for a specific topic, a specific scientist, you want a scientist in your area, you're looking for an expert on a topic someplace, maybe that's something we could help with. Um, visuals, you're creating your own visuals, we don't want to reinvent what you're doing. What can we do to help you make your visuals? I won't claim to have all the answers, maybe I can find people who do. Um, there's the NASA Scientific Visualization Studio, how many of you are familiar with that? Most everybody here, awesome, awesome. And of course the Museum Alliance, directly from the planetary scientists. Are there other places, other ways that you can get the data you need for your visuals? Other ideas or suggestions that you have? Yeah, five second rule, let's go on, okay. Um, one of, we, have, we have one visualizer on our staff and I had him create this model. Um, you, I needed him to make some of this data already for the revised version of Invisible Mars um, that we're working on. We created, it was created for Science on a Sphere. We revised it. Uh, Toshi had originally, thank you Toshi, taken the original model and turned it into a planetarium show. And we've got some new visuals that need to be rendered for the planetarium dome because right now they're rendered for Science on a Sphere. So we're working on that, but it's gonna take a little bit of time. This one shows early Mars changing to current Mars, and it's currently available at NASA's uh, Goddard Scientific Visualization Studio in 4K by 4K. Um, thank you, Tony, for helping us test all of this and get it set for the dome um, and giving advice on it. These are some of the different data sets, and they're very, very basic, very simple. Sorry that they haven't been rendered yet. Um, uh, just landing sites on Mars, um, an early Mars with the aurora that would have existed back in early Mars, um, current Mars with the auroras that have been discovered all over Mars by MAVEN, um, different type of Mars never seen any place else in the solar system before, um, magnetic field because we needed one um, <laughs> for early Mars that it no longer has. So please contact us and let us know how we can help you. Thank you. We have time for questions, is there? Or suggestions or comments are also welcome. Yes. Anybody? All right, well, if you have other questions, feel free to talk to Christina afterwards. Um, but otherwise, let's give her another hand. All right, and now our final speaker of the evening is Patrick McPike, also from the Adler Planetarium and he's going to be talking about dome casting and streaming Havley Lecture Series. So. Looks like I'm closing up shop. I think next year I volunteer for the slot after the hospitality suite. <laughs> I think 
could be more entertaining talk. And, and, and spectators, too. Yeah, exactly. So my name is Patrick McPike. I'm from the Adler Planetarium. Uh, visualization engineer for the Space Visualization Lab. And I'm going to talk about our Copley Lecture Series. So in 2014, uh, we got together with the Copley Foundation. We got a grant to uh, put together a new type of lecture experience. And so um, we came up with some ideas. Uh, we wanted to uh, bring scientists uh, and researchers into the dome, create new uh, immersive visuals to go with uh, what would maybe a traditional PowerPoint for them, uh, bring them together and tell uh, an exciting story uh, and create a new type of experience for them. So that was the overview of it, but as a team, we had some ideas. Um, first, we wanted to uh, reach an audience beyond our walls because if you're going to spend a couple months on a uh, lecture on creating visuals, you didn't want to just have only 200 people see it once in your dome. So dome casting was coming out around the same time, and maybe people have done maybe a dome-to-dome -dome type uh, dome cast, but nobody had thought about doing uh, 12 domes or more, and so we decided to do that. Um, and we started to think about streaming. We didn't start with streaming. Um, but we also wanted to create a business model. If, again, if you're putting all this time into your lecture, um, you know, think about ways that the second lecture could be done easier. Uh, again, creating uh, meaningful visualizations um, that we can share with the public and, and other planetarium after the lecture is done, not just uh, the one time that we uh, do the lecture. So. Time to get your Domecast partners, get to work on the production, get your software partners. And our first lecture uh, was in March of 2015 with Mike Brown. It was perfect timing. Uh, this was right when Mike was uh, coming out with all his research about Planet Nine. Um, again, uh, just really uh, perfect timing for us at the Adler. So this is, again, Mark showed this uh, visualization earlier of the Kuiper Belt, and so we created these beautiful visualizations. We told a great story. It was a success. We domecast over 12 locations for the first uh, domecast. Um, and uh, it was so good that we created our Planet Nine show around it afterwards. Uh, we won a Vizzy for the first lecture. Um, so we were really feeling good, and we rolled right into the next lecture with uh, Michael Turner. So. Michael Turner tells great stories. He's a visual storyteller. Uh, he does uh, everything from the Big Bang to today. So we came up with some new visualizations that kind of matched his storytelling. Um, and we also looked at dome casting to partners um, around the world. So we did multiple time slots. Uh, Mike Brown's lecture was one, one time. And Mike Turner's, we did two different lectures with multiple time slots so we could start to don't cast to partners all over the world. And so we came up with sub such classics as the yellow brick road of everything and the moose diagram of dark matter candidates. Mike's been telling these stories for a long time, so it was a really creative and fun dome cast um, that we did. Um, some of our partners around the world uh, we don't cast the Ghana, and uh, you know, so these are locations that Mike Turner would never be able to go to and present his lecture series. So uh, we're really uh, happy to be able to partner with all these people um, in this lecture series. So then, after that, we did uh, Nurgis Mamavala, and we again perfect timing for us. Uh, it, you know, it was the discovery of gravitational waves and her role in the process. And it was also the first lecture that we started to stream from. So we're streaming and dome casting this lecture uh, here. Um, so we had uh, another maybe 12 uh, or more domes that we dome cast to, but we also were sending uh, the stream to YouTube 360 at the same time. So we were able to partner with the Traveling Telescope. I uh, got on eBay and found 
uh, gyroscope enabled LG phones that had Wi-Fi for less than $80 each. We boxed them up with a bunch of cardboards and shipped them off. And so it was a great way to reach, again, another audience that would even be harder for us to reach normally. And it was very cost efficient to, to, as an institution for us to support this. So it was a, another great partnership. Um, to date, uh, we've had over 25 unique uh, Domecast locations with uh, our first stream had over 100 views. It was a private stream. We didn't even advertise. Uh, over 3,300 live participants, if we totaled up all the domes and all the people um, of, for our lecture series, with 10 million impressions. And an impression is someone who's either read your article, clicked on your links, but maybe didn't attend the audience. So we look at that as maybe a potential audience pool. And from over 10 countries. So we have another lecture coming up in a couple weeks uh, with Lisa Kaltenegger. And this is about uh, Are We Alone in the Universe? Uh, the Search for Life in Exoplanets. So we have a whole new suite of original visualizations to go along with this lecture. We're doing multiple times so we can reach different countries and different locations. And um, we think it's going to be another great series. So please join us if you haven't. You can do it in YouTube or, or uh, Domecasting if you have the capabilities. So where do we go from here? We're doing well. We could keep trickling along, but I think we need to make some changes and start talking about how do you, how do you get a bigger audience uh, even if beyond Domecasting. And I think one of the things as a, a community uh, we need to start thinking about is cross-platform planetarium streaming. So if I have a system from one vendor and you have a system from another vendor, how do I show my show in your planetarium or you show your show in my planetarium if it's a live experience? And with streaming technology, it should be pretty easy, I think. Um, with DirectX and NDI and all these other formats, we should be able to grab a YouTube stream and bring it into our dome live, and it would not matter what platform you're on. And that would be a great way for us to come together and collaborate. I have Xbox and PlayStation here because they still don't play nice together. You can't buy a game on PlayStation and play it on X and, and have, play with your friend who has the same game on Xbox. Even though just last week uh, there was an article that came out, a very popular game accidentally left that ability open and PlayStation sent out a cease and desist and ordered them not to allow cross-platform playing. So if they can do it and they're not doing it, we can do it and we're not doing it, so let's do it. So and we also need to expand streaming. We need to build a following by streaming more often. We can't just have a stream every six months. We have to be doing it weekly, if not daily, at your planetarium. So you build up this audience. This is a new audience. It's not an audience that typically checks the planetarium schedule. Uh, these are people who have watched most of their content online. So how do we tap into that and get them interested into the, of the planetarium? We need to improve the quality of our streams. 4K was not out last stream. It is this stream, so we're going to stream 4K. As soon as that's done, I know 6K will come out. And so this is going to keep getting higher and higher resolutions. That means uh, with the 4K, I can stream a 2K Dome Master to you. Uh, Full 360 would be the 4K. Um, we also want to provide a unique experience uh, with the streaming. And so uh, we're, we got a new camera, so uh, it's a uh, Theta 5, and we can now stream the audience and cut between the audience and the dome, and, and that way our home viewers will feel like they're more part of the experience. And also reach an audience, again, focus on reaching the audience that you can't. So for the next lecture, we've partnered with Lori's Children's Hospital. We are boxing up uh, cardboards. We're going to send them to the Children's Hospital, and they'll be able to participate in the lecture, and knowing multiple of the reasons why they wouldn't be able to make it. So it's a great, um, it feels great to be able to do that. And to encourage you to Domecast more. Uh, many of you have dome casting capabilities, and you may not be doing uh, any dome casts. So uh, the more we do it as a community, the more tools that will be developed, the more we'll become familiar with it. I could see in the future uh, schedule where I could see, you know, Peoria's streaming at seven o'clock, and 
we're streaming at six, and you can start to pick your you know, TV schedule of Planetarium Domecast, and you can build up this entire schedule, and we could all be sharing our shows together. So, again, this is our next one. Um, these are our sites who have signed up so far. We have two that are on here right now, Florida and Moscow. So uh, if you're interested and you don't have uh, a, a Uniview system, which is what we're using right now, you can still participate in the 360 stream, signing up here. Uh, you can also contact Steve Berkland. Steve, raise your hand. Yep. And Steve will take care of it. Steve will get you cardboards if you ask nicely. And uh, so I also finished on time mostly. So in the spirit of October, any questions? <laughs> Yeah, um, looking a bit further into the future, um, what do you think is more likely to happen? Um, if okay, first of all, I have an ENS system, not a universe system. Yep. I would like to try this. You know, it would be the stream that I can play, that I can show post possibly, which would be 2K by 2K, which is okay, you know, um, but not exactly the end point of what we would like to see in the future, which would be a 4K by 4K thing. Do you think it's more likely that we will, uh, that you will once go, or others who might also be streaming, to 4K by 4K streaming? Oh, I, I say I or, think that'll or, be soon. Or do you uh, see an avenue to actually don't cast uh, cross-platform, cross-system? I, I would see the streaming to be the easier way. Um, and you can probably stream 4K Dome Masters with uh, some type of compression codec now, but it, it's not set up yet. So, yeah, I definitely see that happening soon. Okay. Uh, streaming's a great idea, and I think it's, it's getting more and more popular with uh, other communities, like gaming communities and stuff like that, and maybe you can leverage uh, Google or even Twitch against each other to, to find a ways to make these streams more available or put them in front of more people. Exactly. Any, any comments from anyone else on that? <laughs> Sounds great. Sounds great. Okay, good. Keep an eye out on that one. All right, I think we have time for one more before we uh, wrap up. Uh, just want to ask about the open space, uh, the role of uh, the open space software in, in that realm. You didn't mention it because it was used in the Pluto uh, breakfast with Pluto, we were one of the sites who had full dome uh, representation of that, like Chicago. Uh, we had it in Hamburg too. So I think it's, mm, well, the quality is much better. It hits back to the question uh, asked earlier that, uh, well, streaming, yes, but, but if it's uh, dome casting, you can have the, the quality adapts to your dome in the sense because. Uh, if you have an 8K dome, I mean, you can, or 6K or 4K, it, it will really give you the full quality of the dome. Instead, rather than with streaming, you, you have to take what you get. And it's different, it's not interactive, it's not like a combined uh, experience. So I would hope more it's going into that direction. So open space was the question. I'm sorry for. Yeah, we uh, we we've, we've done we view open space. We haven't installed, um, but uh, maybe yeah, Mark, maybe you could say something to that. Well, uh, I was just going to add that um, this idea of simultaneously dome casting and, uh, and streaming the 360 views um, has been done by Evans with uh, open space as well. So the last. Uh, the last stream about uh, solar weather, they also, I watched it on the 360 stream, for example. So I think, you know, doing both simultaneously is great because we can get a bigger market. Our kind of vision is that dome casting, maybe, you know, hopefully we get up to 100 planetariums. You can get thousands of people with the dome cast. Potentially with streaming to people's homes, you could get millions of people. I mean, that's, that's the big vision. Yeah, and they're not going to install open space at home because it's quite difficult to install right now. <laughs> all right, with that, I think we all know what time is it. Thanks. <laughs>